In case you don't know what zero punctuation is and have therefore presumably been living in a cave on the dark side of a moon in the Andromeda galaxy, it is, or was, foreshadowing. A video series is hosted by Benjamin Richard Mustache Contaminating Yahtzee Sebastian Godzilla Ordinary Person Croshaw. Admittedly, only about four of those names are accurate, see if you can guess which ones. Zero Punctuation was famous for primarily five things. The incredibly fast rate at which Yati delivered his script, its incredibly dry, absurdist wit and humour, extraordinarily harsh criticism and high standards bordering on the unreasonable and contradictory, its unique presentation style which looked like a Paper Mario game if you had recently suffered a concussion, and also a lot of swearing. It is admittedly a fairly difficult series to describe if one hasn't seen it before, but the good thing about it is that if you're even vaguely familiar with the communities involved or interested in video games or the internet at all, then you already know exactly who Yahtzee is and what Zero Punctuation is, as the sheer reach and popularity of the series cannot be overstated. Anyway, Zero Punctuation was probably the first series that I recall watching that was actually dedicated specifically to reviewing video games. When I was introduced to it, at the time there were a number of online personalities that I enjoyed who reviewed games, but they also did a whole bunch of other stuff. Reviews were only a small part of their repertoire, while Zero Punctuation was more specifically focused on games and their mechanics, and being angry. I still distinctly remember the very first episode that I saw when a friend introduced it to me. It was the Mind Jack one back in 2011. I've been following ever since, so it's safe to say that I've been a long time viewer. So you like about Yardzi, but the bloke has a gift for humour that makes him incredibly enjoyable to watch if you don't take his word as gospel. I actually in part have to credit Yardzi for sparking my interest in critical analysis, which has developed to be far more broad, ranging from not only video games, but to other mediums. He's definitely the first viewer that I encountered that made me start looking at not only video games but media broadly with a lot more of a critical lens and start thinking about aspects of media that I don't think would have occurred to me to think about. Of course, that was never the main point of Zero Punctuation, but it was an interesting side effect that I find myself pondering whenever I watch or rewatch episodes of the series while doing work, falling asleep, or tormenting the prisoners I have chained up in the basement. Not that I entirely agree with him on basically everything, we divert quite drastically. In fact, one of the things I've noticed is that if he likes a game and recommends it, there's a good chance that I'll like it. I played Spec Ops The Line due to his recommendation and I still haven't emotionally recovered, but for like half the games he talks about that he hates, I then play it, enjoy it, and then have to wonder what the blinking buggery game he played. My favourite one right now is Watch Dogs, a game I played about a month ago at time of writing where he complained about the main character's sister not recognising him as the vigilante even after the news began to broadcast his name and I remember thinking, buddy, she had been held hostage for like 80% of the game in a garage in an old construction yard and for 100% of the time that the news has been doing that, when would she have heard this? We're exceptionally different people with very different tastes. He's a pessimist, I'm an optimist, he hates anime, I love anime. He wears a hat, I wear a hood. He hates Assassin's Creed, I love Assassin's Creed. He hates Assassin's Creed 3, I plan on throwing the protagonist to free at him like a ballistic missile in some sort of horrific analogy of European colonialism. But still, I tend to be able to figure out if I'll enjoy a game or not based on his recommendations. Which I think means he's a fairly solid reviewer as far as reviewers go. But none of you came here to hear about any of that. So why am I doing this, you ask? Mostly because no one has stopped me yet. What the fuck are you doing in my house, viewer? That is a very good question. Let's talk about that, shall we? So, after 16 years and 835 episodes, Zero Punctuation as a series has been cancelled. And this wasn't done as some sort of retiree thing, like Yati just got tired of the series and wanted to quit. No, this happened because of executive meddling, corporate acquisitions, and one of the most satisfying missteps I've ever seen. Given the absolute megalithic stable of internet culture that the series had become, I want to talk about this and how it all went down and what we can learn from it. Because this entire series of events is a microcosm of the issue permeating the contemporary age. And one that I hope to God that the human race will remember by the time of this is all said and done because I do not want to see this repeated on Mars, Venus, Alpha Centauri or basically anywhere else. In fact, screw it, let's open this section up with both a reference and a spoiler. Let's all laugh at economic system which is fundamentally incapable of working with the needs of the people who prop it up in the first place that should be readjusted to do so. That never learns anything, tee hee hee. Yes, I'm about to subtle as a freight train running into the Houses of Parliament. So, let's start this off with some history, shall we? The year is 2007, and Fedora Man has posted the first episode of what will become Zero Punctuation on the video sharing website YouTube under the channel name Yahtzee19. This series was titled Fully Ramblematic, and will consist of only two episodes, one on the demo of The Darkness, and the other on Fable The Lost Chapters. After these two were released, Yahtzee was contacted by an internet gaming magazine and website known as the Round Table of Satan, I mean The Escapist, a group which is, as far as I can tell, run by a bunch of abject psychopaths. They recruited Yahtzee and the series and rebranded it as Zero Punctuation and thus was born the subject of today's autopsy. 
and remained on there for 16 years both on their website and on the Escapers' own YouTube channel. Now, one thing that the Escapers had going for it was a lot of talent. Various internet personalities that I enjoyed in the past and continue to do so to this day were at one point affiliated with the site, from Jim slash Jim slash Stephanie Sterling to Miracle of Sound to Extra Credits. Systematically though, with the near precision of a goddamn serial killer, the Escapists' insidiousness began, and everyone began to live up to its name and perform the escaping acts to get away from it. The extra credit situation in particular deserves a bit of attention, because what happened to them is going to be something of a recurring theme with what ended up happening with Zero Punctuation and part of the conclusive thesis statement. In 2011, a dispute between The Escapist and James Port, now the co-creator of Extra Credits, erupted. A dispute regarding money, also known as power coupons, also known as that being that keeps screwing everything up that we really should just abolish as a concept and be done with it, but anyway. Essentially what happened was that the extra credits artist needed surgery and the team hadn't been paid for months. According to the research I did, this was something that the corporate owners were fully aware of, they just didn't care. So the extra credits team crowdfunded the surgery, got enough money and then a whole lot more. The art of surgery got done and the team decided to use the rest of the money to start a game publishing label, the revenue of which would go into other projects. The Escapist, which I will remind you again, hadn't paid them in months for putting them into this situation in the first place, and then had the sheer baffling nerve to say that the excess money should have been going towards making more episodes of extra credits for The Escapist, presumably for them to make more money that they weren't going to pay the team with. Now there's a whole legal argument wrapped up in all of this, but whether or not The Escapist had a legal right to demand any of this, I couldn't care less about. Morally speaking, if I were involved with the extra credits team at the time, I'd have been out for blood. Mostly for The Escapist, I wasn't, and they just split off, but made sure everyone else knew what had happened. It's hard to imagine what the executives involved in this mess were even expecting to happen. D did they think that they had just gotten free indentured servants forever? You'd think that it would make more logical and business sense to keep a showrunner like this on site so that long term they generate more interest and income than you would get out of screwing them over, but that apparently just never occurred to anyone. Other stuff happened over the years. Sterling left after they refused to publish a negative Assassin's Creed Unity review that they wrote for fear of isolating industry contacts and access to review codes. Speaking as an Assassin's Creed fan, I too would be infuriated at not being able to make my contempt for that failure of an entry known. Miracle of Sound also left, but according to them at least, on good terms. Fair enough, although I imagine they're quite pleased with that choice right about now. This combined with a bunch of other controversies and you get the idea. This entire site had devolved into a cesspool, with Yahtzee being one of its only contracted workers at the time. This entire period saw a decline in basically the entire site, except for zero punctuation, which it might not be an exaggeration to say single-handedly kept the site afloat. Cut forward to 2018, and the escapers were sold, relaunched, and new talent was brought in. Not necessarily in that order, mind. One of those being a bloke called Nick Calandra, who became the editor-in-chief in 2019. For a while it seemed like the escapers was doing better than they had been following the decline it had been on. And Calandra is the main building block to all that happened next. By and large, during his time as editor-in-chief at The Escapist, Calandra was popular among the video team and regarded as fair, even-handed and generally quite reasonable. But in September of 2022, the company that owned The Escapist sold it to another company called Gamers Group. That's almost certainly not how it's pronounced, but I refuse to show this company any amount of respect for the following reason. In November of 2023, Calandra was fired from The Escapist by Gamers Group, apparently for not achieving goals. Whatever that's supposed to mean. That's so non-specific it can mean literally anything and forgive me for not taking a corporation at their word. Whatever the reasoning behind it was, the entire video team including Yahtzee left The Escapist outright in solidarity with Calandra, effectively leaving The Escapist channel dead in the water. And so came an end to zero punctuation. The entire thing was genuinely quite incredible to watch. Gamers did the game journalism equivalent of buying a giant tower made of gold to survey all the diamond fields that they had purchased along with it, only to shoot themselves in the foot with a bazooka and obliterate the tower wholesale. Hilariously enough, many of the creators involved had a couple of episodes that they had made ahead of schedule before leaving, and when The Escapist posted them after a two week pause in their upload schedule, they disabled the comment section, apparently thinking that this would somehow limit the fallout. Cowards. Okay, in total fairness, that same day they did post a community message, but that's like the rapid speak disclaimers at the end of an advertisement. You're just covering yourself and hoping that no one notices at that point. Well done, lads. I don't know how you thought this was going to go, but I thank you for adding yet another entry into my corporation's don't know what they're doing library. Now get out of here before I pull an Altair. Well, I'm actually rather glad to be able to report that this title screen is inaccurate because lessons have been learned this time around. 
After leaving the Escapist, the video team got straight to work and made Second Wind, a group with a similar style of content to the work that they did on the Escapist, but this time as an employee-owned, independently funded outlet, where the people who actually make the content that allowed the Escapist to remain relevant all these years have a stake in the outlet and understand how they collectively operate. Isn't that a novel idea? That the people who actually do the work for making a company profitable actually get a say in how the outlet is run? Wild. When the Escapist began to hire new talent, a number of new series came along with it, my personal favourites being The Stuff of Legends, hosted by Frost, and Design Delve, hosted by Jay. These new shows, also taking from Zero Punctuation's tense pole art style and apparent cinematic universe, seem to be getting far more exposure and respect now that they've all gone independent along with Second Wind. And Yahtzee himself has started up a new series, or rather, is continuing an old one, fully ramblematic, in the exact same Zero Punctuation style. We've come full circle seemingly in a deeply amusing middle thing you're being held up to the escapist. It's actually great. Before, fully ramblematic was all one word. Now there's a space between fully and ramblematic. And to be technical, it was fully ramblematic review. Ed Go, legally distinct from the series the escapist picked up in the first place, and the most thinly veiled piss off in the face I've ever seen. It's great. Which, if you recall my analysis of Big D, that's a World of Darkness thing for those of you who aren't initiated, don't get excited, is always something I find delightfully amusing. It seems to me that the Escapist needs these people a hell of a lot more than they need the Escapist. As much as I'd like to say the Escapist bad, Gamers bad, and Corporations bad, the knockoff for lunch, it isn't that simple. Frankly, I can't even entirely blame the Escapist for the mess with zero punctuation itself. The extra credit situation and a bunch of other stuff after that, sure, because that was primarily perpetuated by a co-owner and founder of the site. None of the workers, not then, not now, nor likely in the future. A worker likely wouldn't be put into a position to create such an absolute mess like that in the first place. And if they were, they would have been fired on the spot. But if you note, the same basic issue arose in both situations. In both situations, the management were the ones at fault, either mistreating their workers, outright lying, or making a mess of things. And they can do this freely because there's basically no one at the site that can rein them in. Unless they're answering to a parent company if they have one. Or a government. The primary issue here is the hierarchy between those who do the work for these outlets and those that own them. And the secondary issue is money. It essentially creates a scenario where people with near unchecked power in a workplace can attempt to exploit those around them for money. Something a lot of them are driven to do due to the fact that we currently live in a world where money is needed for everything, from lobbying governments to being able to eat food. It's a source of power. It's power coupons. In other words, the powerful trying to get more powerful. To use a video game analogy to at least pretend that we're keeping this on track, imagine a game where you can keep getting more and more money and you can use it to buy like a thousand health potions so you can never lose. That's basically what's happening with the wealthy. Only in this analogy they get their money by slapping you in the face, which would be exploiting your labour. And Gamers in this analogy bought a bunch of health potions, drank them all at once, passed out in the road and got hit by a bus. There's no question in my mind that the choice to fire Calandra was made by some sort of higher up who doesn't understand video games, the culture of the industry they're in, or view the games industry only as a product, rather than an art form. You know, the kind of higher ups who fought to put purchasable time savers into video games to help you quote, skip the grind, who then also exerted influence on the actual game designers to make the game more grind heavy in the first place, because if they didn't, no one would want to buy the time savers. You know, those gibbons whose hands on every facet of contemporary culture to turn it into part of a corporate machine, who when the sales are still too low, will issue a round of layoffs to perpetuate the myth of infinite growth, which only contributes to games getting worse worse and worse and worse and hey have you noticed that this is the same issue that gripped the escapist? Executives making choices that are so utterly detached from the work being done by the workers that it just makes everything worse. This isn't a gamers problem, tempting as it is to blame them. The escapers did this back with the extra credits team remember, all on their own. The basic issue hasn't changed, only the face of it has. Yes, the zero punctuation situation specifically was their fault, but assigning the blame as if there's some uniquely bad outlet in all of this misses the forest for the trees in an entirely different forest on the surface of Europa. It's becoming more and more apparent, day by day, that a great number of executives who own companies that own other companies that own other companies, in reality, have no idea what they're doing. At best, they have no idea what's going on. At worst, they're complete egomaniacs. The greatest lesson one could perhaps learn from this entire escapade is that it's the workers who actually make the corporation its profit. Without them, the corporation has nothing. Imagine if all the people who work for any number of contemporary corporations simply stopped working. 
Disney, Marvel, DC, Paramount, Sony, Ubisoft. Nothing will get done. Can anyone seriously envision Yves Guimau or any other Ubisoft executives making an Assassin's Creed game themselves? But of course, they're quite happy to order the developers to put in loot boxes and microtransactions and force them to make the games grind so they can sell time saver mechanics and then reap the profits right after they fire the devs to make the profit sheets look better. Does it not seriously bother anyone else that industries that are ostensibly built around providing entertainment and art to enrich lives are so frequently run by people whose only interest is a quarterly income and obligations to shareholders? I would much rather live in a world where the creators, writers, designers, artists and programmers of games like Undertale, Assassin's Creed, Spiritfarer, Fallout New Vegas, Pokemon and Baldur's Gate are the ones actually calling the shots, who know what needs to happen and given the freedom to actually do it. A naive prospect, perhaps. But that's what Second Wind has gone on to do. Perhaps most industries would benefit from actual worker ownership so that overpaid executives who haven't got the faintest idea what their workers are doing don't interfere, are so detached from the culture and environment of their fields that they do something as completely inexplicable as an episode of The Muppets directed by H.P. Lovecraft. Like trying to sell you time savers so that you don't have to play the game you bought to play if that makes any amount of sense. How was that allowed to happen for any length of time? I'm not going to sit here and claim the second win is going to be perfect. Hell, I'm not even going to sit here and claim that this video is going to be relevant or age well within a month. What I am saying is that second win to me represents a direction that I'm eager to bear witness to. Without these creators, The Escapist has nothing to its name. And endeavours like Second Wind exist as a good reminder of that. Not only for corpus, but for anyone interested in entering a field of any sort. None of this is exclusive to video games or entertainment media. Know what you're worth, and know what your contributions and works are worth and that they matter. And encourage others to recognise that too. Remind those who profit off your labour exactly who is giving them that profit in the first place. Before we wrap this up, I want to express my full support for Second Wind's endeavours. It's about time you all made the jump. Frankly, a lot of you deserve a hell of a lot better than what you were getting at The Escapist, and I'm hoping that Second Wind is a massive success. And if it isn't, well, you tried and I admire that. Any attempt in this horrendous late-stage capitalist dystopia to break away from traditional corporate structures is one to be celebrated and remembered in the history books, so that the future space historians of the future have a frame of reference for one of the earliest examples of how their utopia came to be. Now for the love of God, don't crash and burn, Second Wind. Also want to thank them for letting me use their music, in case you wanted to know where that was from. I've removed this as a matter of courtesy, but I still wanted to express my thanks for the permission. I'll be back to my normal style next time. The gimmick of using Yati Sar to slag off the escapists was just too enticing a prospect for me. In the meantime, feel free to check out any of my other videos and like and subscribe if you are so inclined, and I shall see you all next time.